Here you see an Outdoors RV 21 FBS 2019 model. Um, and uh, I'm uh, in the process of changing the uh, shocks and uh, repacking the wheel bearings. And I thought I'd just record the process and maybe it'll help some people out. I've got the whole trailer up on jack stands. Um, I went around and jacked up each corner of it two inches at a time and put a jack stand under it and kept doing that until I had all the tires off the ground. And I checked to make sure that it's level so there's not like a twist on the frame or anything like that. I've also, I've already replaced one of the shocks and repacked the, one of the, uh, the wheel bearings. Um, so on the uh, front right wheel here you see that there's a original Monroe shock and um, on the uh, rear one the silver shock is a KYB shock. Um, what I'm going to show you uh, is probably somewhat specific to Outdoors RV trailers but um, I'm sure many trailers have similar suspension systems and use similar com components. The original Monroe shock is a uh, 555001 and I'm replacing it with the KYB which is a uh, KG5514. Um, the shocks are uh, somewhat different in length. Here they're shown fully extended um, and the uh, KYB shock is about two inches longer in length. I um, found this part number on various uh, Outdoors RV uh, um, the Facebook page and, and also there were some posts on, on uh, a website so, and I was surprised when this uh, came in and there was that much different in length. I looked up the specs on the sh sock, shocks and sure enough, the KYB is actually about two inches longer extended and about one inch longer compressed than the original Monroe. So I called up Outdoors RV and checked with them and they said that they had not changed the suspension geomet geometry on their trailers in years and that for a while they were equipping them with Monroes and now they've switched over to this particular KYB part and everything's good. So even though they're a different uh, length, it appears that the, uh, the, the range of travel of both shocks are suitable for both trailers. I'll just make the comment that uh, this one that I'm looking at now was not leaking. Um, however, uh, I can compress this with one, with one hand quite easily. And now I'm holding it in the compressed position with just my finger. <laughs> so that shock is probably pretty well worn out. Um, the KYB shock may be stiffer new. I don't know. I don't have a new Monroe to compare it to. But I cannot compress it with one hand. It takes all of my body weight to compress the shock. And I'll show you later that you need to be able to compress the shock in order to install it. Here we are again back at the trailer. There's the, the new shock installed. There's the... Uh, old shock ready to come out. This one uh, was leaking or is leaking. Um, and I just want to point out that um, what I have been doing is using, now that the entire weight is taken off the suspension, um, I've been using a jack to lift up one of the axles. Like right now I've lifted up this, this front axle and that tilts the rear axle so it uh, there's more length, more room to get the shock in. So Another thing is that lubricating these fittings here requires taking the weight off the fittings because the way the bolts are drilled um, when they're under load you can't get grease into them. So now by having the trailer all jacked up I'm able to lube, lube these uh, grease fittings and at the same time uh, get myself enough length to be able to get the shock in. Um, so the first step in replacing the shock obviously is to get the old ones off and as you can see they're pretty rusted. Um, they both, I got the first one off eventually, you know, in a muffler shop or something like that that replaces shocks on cars. They just cut these things off with a, with a oxyacetylene torch. Um, but I don't have an oxyacetylene torch, so I'm going to have to try to get them off by unthreading them. So the first thing I'm going to do is put some penetrating oil on them. So when it comes to penetrating oil, a lot of people think of WD-40 as penetrating oil. That's not what that stuff is. There are much higher performing uh, penetrating oils. Um, the one I happen to have now is this brand Blaster. Um, works pretty well, but there are other, you know, professional grade penetrating oils that work well too. Um, so I'm just going to apply some of that on each of the 
each of the bolts top and bottom. Hard to do with one hand as I'm holding the camera, but anyway, I'm going to go around and apply this to um, all of the bolts on the shocks on, on the other side of the trailer too. Okay, so on the upper bolts on these particular shocks, there's a uh, double nut, there's a, a, a nut and a lock nut put on it. On the lowers, uh, I'll get the camera at the good angle here. Um, there's a, uh, a nylock nut, a nylon self-locking nut, so it's not double nutted. So the challenge here is to get something onto that bolt and uh, remove the nut. There's a, uh, the end of the bolt has kind of flat sides on it. You can put uh, channel locks or uh, vice grips or something on that to hold it while you're turning the nut off. Or you can just use channel locks on the body of the shock, but you don't want to use too... You know, you don't want to squeeze too hard there. You don't want to uh, burst it, but because it is a gas-filled uh, shock, but um, don't use too much pressure. But you can grab it, whatever, wherever you can, and try to get those bolts loose. So, using a uh, an open-end wrench and a, and a 9 6 9, 9 open-end 916 socket, I'm going to take off the lock nut first. Okay, the lock nut came off pretty easy. Uh, so now I'm going to proceed with the, uh, the second nut. Okay, surprisingly, uh, that uh, nut came off pretty easy, and as soon as I took the nut off, you can see that the shock has kind of collapsed down into a compressed position. This is the one that was leaking, so that shows that this thing's you know, definitely shot. All right, now I'm going to proceed to the lower nut that has the lilac nut, nylock nut on it. Okay, so here's the setup I'm using to get that lower nut off, just a pair of channel locks on the body of the shock, and uh, you know, a deep socket on 916 socket again. Okay, so that came off relatively easily, no big challenge. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the shock is, is, is collapsed. I can pull it down a little bit and get it right out of there. Um, that's a, only because the shock is shot. If it were uh, in better condition, I would have to work at it a little bit more to compress it and get it out of there. There you go, we have the um, hardware. Well, by the way, this trailer, one, uh, uh, rubber two and a half years old, I bought it uh, six months ago. Uh, my wife and I drove out from upstate New York to uh, uh, Minneapolis to pick it up. Um, the guy that we bought it from bought it new uh, in early 2020. Um, and uh, he thought he put about 20,000 miles on it. So 20,000 miles of use has worn out the shock and um, wore out a set of tires. We put brand new tires on it when we first bought it. Um, and uh, I was surprised that with uh, that much time on it, the uh, bolts holding the shocks on uh, were as easy to get off as they were. Anyway, the job was relatively straightforward so far. So here's a little trick I invented uh, to try to, or to hold the um, shock absorber in a compressed position. Um, I took a uh, floor jack and compressed the uh, shock underneath the frame of the trailer and then wrapped some wire around it to hold it into that position and now I'll be able to get into get it into position uh, without compressing it um, in the process of putting them in, in place which would be pretty tough. So here are the parts that come with the new shocks um, you know on each end of the shock you have to have two bushings and two of these washers and also they provide um, two two bolts for each end of the shock um, one or two nuts one nut uh, is a little thicker than the other that will go on first. The second one is a thinner nut. It's a, just for a lock nut. And before uh, I put together anything um, that is going to get rusty like this, usually I use uh, a uh, material called the anti-seize compound. Um, keeps the nuts from rusting on, or at least it does better than not using it. So um, just put a little dab of it on each end before you put the, the bolts together, the nuts together. So when you put the wire on there, make sure that you wrap the wire around like that so that you can get it out of there once you put the hardware on. There you go, we have the hardware, one washer and one uh, rubber bushing on each end. And so then we can very easily slide the uh, lower part of the shock in there 
and the uh, we have got this compressed so far that, that it's actually shorter than it needs to be so I'm going to have to put down the phone while I uh, undo the wire and allow it to uh, uh, go into place. So here it is in place. One thing I forgot to mention is that before I put this in, I actually um, jacked up on the other axle. We've got a bottle jack under the other axle, which lifts that side up, pivots the, uh, the equalizer part of the um, suspension so that the uh, axle where I'm putting the shock on is uh, dropped down and that gives me even more room to be able to get the shock in. So now I have to put the, uh, the nuts on. Again, uh, what, what goes on next is uh, one more washer and one more rubber bushing on each end. Rubber bushing first, washer on top of it, and then I'll put one of the fat nuts on and then one of the uh, lock washers on. And um, I always, anytime I'm putting something together that's, that's uh, likely to rust, I always use the anti-seize compound on it. This is the Permatex brand, but there's other brands available. And anytime I'm putting something together that's going to rust, I always put a little bit on. Um, I already put some on there. You can't really see it. But uh, look at the other end. And I've got some of that on there. Okay, so there's the uh, installed shock. Um, don't forget to put the jam nut on there to lock up against the primary nut. Snug those up tight. You don't have to uh, compress those rubber bushings too much. Just until they get a little bit of a bulge is fine. Um, so the next step is uh, to lubricate the chassis. So there's some grease fittings. One of them's missing in one place. I'll have to replace that one. And there's one in the rear. And those don't take grease uh, from what I've read unless you've got the suspension off the chassis. And I did try to grease them before I jacked it up, and, and uh, or at least the ones on the other side I tried, and, and, and they would not take grease until I got the weight off of it. So that seems to be the trick. Get the weight off of it and then grease the, um, these bolts. Okay, so I was able to replace the Zerk fitting and get greased to, in all these fittings, so that's all greased up. So the next step is to um, pack the wheel bearings. And the first step there is to take this cap off here. Um, you got to get something in behind there to pry it off. It's a little too narrow a gap for a screwdriver so I use a uh, putty knife uh, to get it started. So I'll... Okay so here's the crap. The cap you can see it's got some grease on the inside of it and the nut on the end of the spindle and um, what we want to do is pry, pry this uh, this retainer off I'm not really familiar with the kind of retainer it used to be cotter pins, but and so now you can see that there's a zerk fitting on the end of the axle spindle, and that's the uh, that's the easy lube. That's how you get the grease into it if you're using easy lube. But what I'm going to do is take the, this apart and um, repack the bearing by hand, and then finish it off with the easy lube. You can see that this grease is really kind of runny. Um, I don't know if it's because the prior owner used uh, the wrong kind of grease or whether it's just from heat that has been breaking down. But at any rate, um, I'm going to take it all apart, clean the, all, all the old grease out of it, and put new grease in it. So once you get the nut off, then underneath that is a washer. A washer and the outer bearing, which I'll clean the old grease out of that. And then we can take the hub off, and underneath the hub is the grease seal, which you can see there has been some grease that has come through that, not a lot. The, the fresh looking grease probably just came off as I, as I removed the hub off of the spindle. So up here, here's your uh, electric brake magnet. 
and this is not too worn these are your brake shoes they're not too worn so everything looks fine all I need to do is clean up the grease off of this now I have to take the seal off of that um, to get the inner bearing out and there's a seal removal tool which I can't find mine so I'm going to use a pry bar to do that now I'm going to destroy the seal in the process of getting it out of there but that's okay because it's my intention to replace the seal anyway So this is now all distorted and everything. I'm just going to throw that away. And here's the inner bearing, which needs to be cleaned up and repacked. And then the whole inside of the hub is loaded with grease. And this grease is really kind of runny. Like I said, it's it's surprising. I don't I don't know if it's just the heat that has broken that down. But I'm going to get the old grease all out of there and clean it all up. And I'll pack the bearing and put it back together. So the first step in cleaning everything is just to wipe all the grease off of it. These are just wiped clean with rags. And I got a garbage can full of rags there, full of grease. And there's the hub. I've wiped all the grease out of that. Wiped all the grease off the spindle. So the next problem is how if you want to get all the old grease out of the bearings, how you do that. Well, if you work in a commercial shop, uh, you probably have like a safety clean, parts cleaner or something like that. Um, as a backyard mechanic, uh, all my life I've used uh, gasoline. Probably somebody's going to tell me that's unsafe, and I'm sure it is, but that's what I do. I just take a small quantity of uh, gasoline, and individually I rinse each bearing out in it. And you can spin the bearing to get all the grease out of it. And uh, once you've got all the grease out of it, then you can dry it off. And just let it evaporate or if you have an air compressor you can blow it out but do not use the air compressor to blow the uh, dry bearing and make it spin like that because that's not good for the bearing so then once you've got it all clean you can inspect it here it's not perfectly clean but you can see the bearing these little rollers you want to make sure that they don't have pits or gall galling marks on them or anything like that they want to be smooth and shiny like that this bearing looks just fine um, and, uh, and the, uh, <coughs> the race, which is the part that's in the hub that the bearing rides on, you also want to inspect that to make sure that that's clean and smooth and shiny. Um, I'm going to, you know, finish cleaning these and drying them uh, after I turn off the camera, but I just want to show you how this whole thing goes together so you understand how this works. So there's a seal that goes in the hub that holds this bearing in place but their bearing rides against a race which is that tapered surface that's right in here right that's called the outer race the inner race is the part that i have my fingers going through so the rollers are going to run on that inner race and they're going to run on that outer race but because the diameter or the circumference of the inner race and the outer race are different the rollers can't just completely roll they slip a little bit and that's why you got to have the grease um, and anyway, so when you assemble that in the hub and you put the seal in it, when, then when you put the hub in place, that goes on here like this. All right, and then the hub's going to be on there. And then after the hub is on there, then you put the outer bearing in here. And the nut presses that out, outer bearing in, not until it's in hard contact, but we're going to talk about that later. But anyway, that's how it works. So the hub is here and it rotates on those bearings. And then how, how does grease get in it? Well, we're going to hand pack these bearings, but this axle has something called Easy Lube, which is, it has a zerk fitting on the end. You squeeze grease into that. It has a hole that runs down the length of the shaft, and it comes out a hole over there that's cross-drilled in the shaft. And so from that hole, when you pump the grease in, it fills up the space back here, fills up that bearing, and then it pumps in this volume that's in between the hub and the bearings and it flows out to the outer bearing 
and it loads up the outer bearing with grease. And then lastly, it comes out, actually holes that are drilled in here to allow grease to escape. So later on when we grease it, you'll see that I'll pump grease in here and it'll come out the end. Um, but first we're gonna finish cleaning everything up, dry it all off, put it back together, and or we'll hand pack the bearings first and then we'll put it back together. Okay, so here's all my parts all kind of cleaned up and dried off. They tell you to um, dry it off with a lint-free rag, so I always use a, you know, synthetic rag. Um, and uh, here's the, uh, the, the hub uh, with the brake drum. And we didn't talk about brakes yet, but the way the brakes work is that magnet right there, when that becomes energized, it gets pulled up against this surface right here. And that surface might on the video look like it's grooved, but it's not. It's, it's pretty good. Um, so we don't have to do anything about that. But when that magnet uh, hits up against that surface and it grabs, then it pulls this arm right here. And it actually, I'm, I'm pulling it in the direction that it would be if the trailer were going in reverse. But um, and same thing happens, only with more force in the other direction. And it, that causes these shoes to expand, the brake shoes. Um, that diameter just becomes larger um, by this thing uh, squeezing apart and um, it presses up against this surface right here um, that's the braking surface so like in a car you know that doesn't have electric brakes you don't have this inner part um, this part here you only have this part here um, but anyway the uh, uh, important thing about that is that it did not have grease on it so when I was handling this thing to clean it and everything else, I'm sure I got grease on it, so I had to clean that off. And for that, you want to use, um, to clean the braking surfaces, you want to use uh, something that's designed for um, cleaning brakes. Now, this can has been sitting on the shelf in my garage for maybe 15 years or something like that, so I don't even know if this specific product is available anymore. And probably has nasty chemicals in it that you can't even buy anymore but there's some kind of brake cleaner that you can get from the automotive parts uh, store and use that to clear to clean these surfaces on the brake drum that the magnet and the um, brake shoes ride against and if you did happen to get some grease on the brake shoes themselves uh, don't worry about it you can just clean that off with with uh, um, the same type of cleaner um, so the next thing I'm going to do now is I'm going to repack the bearing. Now, the uh, uh, packing the bearings uh, can be done by hand, and that's what I have done all my life. Uh, there was a product that came on the market, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, that had really good reviews. I bought it and tried it. I didn't like it. I'm going back to, or I never, never went forward and didn't use that product at all. I'm just going to do everything by hand, but it's really easy to do. There's a million videos on the web, I'm sure but um, I'll give you a little quick uh, idea of how to pack a bearing. So this is the product I was talking about. It's uh, called a Easy Squeeze. What you're supposed to do is put the bearing in there, and there's another part that I don't have here that you squeeze down, and it's supposed to squeeze the grease into the bearing. Um, I didn't find it easy to squeeze, and um, I just didn't, I guess you can put it in a vise and uh, squeeze it with a vise, but I don't, carry a vice with me so um, doing it on the road would be Im impossible or inconvenient but it's not that hard to pack a bearing by hand so I'm going to show you how to do that right now I'm going to use the bear the grease that's in in the cup here so I don't waste it but I'm going to ask my wife to hold the camera so I can demonstrate this so all you do is you just take a little grease and you put it in the palm of your your hand and then you take the bearing I usually start on the, the wider side of the bearing and you just rub it like this so that it pushes the grease up into the bearing and as you do that you'll see grease come up through in between the rollers and it's starting to come up now so if you look real close right here by my finger there's grease coming up through the rollers so then you just rotate around the perimeter of the bearing and you keep doing that until you see grease come up through and you just go around so it just takes you know a couple minutes to get started and then once you're started and it comes squeezing up through you know you're you're on your on your way 
So you just go, again, you go all the way around the perimeter of the bearing, making sure that you have grease through. And then once you've done that, you can hold the inside of the bearing and rotate it. And that makes, make sure that you have grease distributed all around. And then you can go around again, rubbing it up through like that. And as you can see, it's coming through again. So I'm going to keep greasing up this bearing until I get it fully loaded with grease. And I'm going to do the other one and I'll be back in a minute. So I want to talk about parts and supplies for a minute. Uh, how do, how did, where did I get my parts and how did I know what parts to get? Well, um, this is a Dexter axle. I knew that much. So I looked on the uh, Dexter website and I found a local dealer. Um, and I ended up uh, calling them up and they told me I needed to know what the diameter what the size of my brakes was, both the diameter and the width of the brake shoes. Um, apparently, Dexter makes several different axles, uh, but there are many parts in common. Um, and as long as you know what your brake diameter is, you're going to be able to get everything you need to know, assuming you have a Dexter axle. Um, <laughs> I don't know about the other brands. Anyway, turned out my, my uh, brakes are 10 inch diameter, and I think it was two and a half inches wide. There was a 10 inch inch diameter like one and a half or one and three quarters something like that anyway it was pretty easy to figure out uh which series of brakes i have they um it could be you know eight ten or twelve um and once i knew that i knew what parts or they knew what parts to provide me with so here's what i bought um the uh things that have kind of a greenish ring those are the seals here's these are seals and we're going to put them in in a minute um, I bought one pair of brake of uh, bearings. This is the inner and the outer bearing um, Just in case I ran into a bearing that was bad and if I don't at least I've got a spare pair of bearings I also bought um, one extra magnet um, Just in case uh, one of the magnets turned out to be bad um, Once I get into the job I didn't want to have to you know run out for parts But I was pretty confident that I wasn't going to run into any real disaster because they took one wheel apart first to look at it and I said everything looks pretty good probably all the other ones are going to be good too so that's 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 what I bought um, the, uh, the, the 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 seals you can see they have a little spring on the inside of them that um, kind of helps that seal stay tight up against the hub um, there's probably different grades of seals um, they didn't offer me more than one grade this is just what they had to fit the trailer and then as far as grease goes, I looked in the Dexter manual that came with my trailer, and they gave a bunch of different specs. I went into the auto parts store to buy grease, and none of the ones that they listed in the manual were available, probably because the manual is older and companies have introduced new products. So what I ended up buying was this Valvoline product. Um, the one spec that um, Dexter had in their manual was this NLGI number two. I don't know what that means, but... Um, Almost all the greases I looked at it have that, and it needs to be uh, a lithium-based grease, and I think somewhere on this, uh, this is a blue lithium grease. So the important thing you want to look for is, you know, lithium and that it has that spec. Well, the other spec is that uh, dropping point, 500 degree F. I think uh, um, the Dexter axle spec was actually a lower temperature than that. So this met or exceeded all the specs that Dexter had. That's what I bought. That's what I've been using. Um, I'm using that both to uh, grease the bearings and to uh, grease those fittings that I showed you earlier. Um, you know, put that tube in the grease gun and I can do everything I need to do. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is put one of these seals in. What I've done uh, while I was away is uh, I greased up the inner bearing and I placed it, uh, you know, narrow side first into the, into the hub and I greased up the outer bearing. It's sitting here all ready to go. Um, so now we have to get this seal in here. So the way you get the seal in is you try to put it in, try to put it in so it's level and, and flat and even. And then you can take a block of wood and using a hammer gently, you can drive that seal in. And you want to just try to make sure to drive it in nice and straight, nice and square. Um, so I can't do this with uh, one hand, so I'm going to have to put the phone down, um, but it's not too much of a trick to do it with a block of wood. They do have uh, special tools for this that um, you don't really need. You can use a block of wood, no problem. And one thing is that you may be tempted, once you drive that thing in there, to want to drive it down until it's below that edge. You can do that, but really that's not what you want to do. You want this 
surface, this gr green surface that you see here, you want that to be flush with this edge here. And if, you, if it's flush all the way around, then you know that the seal is in square. Because once that seal goes on and we put the hub on, the seal is going to ride on, on this shoulder up here. Um, and so I've cleaned off that shoulder and checked to make sure that it doesn't have any burrs or, you know, nasty scratches or anything like that. But as that seal rotates, the drum is going to rotate around and the seal is going to rotate around with it. It's going to rub on that, on that uh, cylindrical part right here. Um, and um, so you want the seal to be in the hub square so that it, it, it you know, goes around that spindle nice and smooth. Okay, so I drove the seal in, as you can see, it's all flush with this, this hub. And so now I'm ready to put the hub on, um, which again, I need two hands to do that, so I'm going to put the phone down. But it's, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is slide it onto the spindle until it goes far back enough that, it's, that the seal goes up on, on this shoulder here. Okay, so now the hub is on. And I can put the outer bearing in place. And then the washer. And then the nut. Now, I'm working with my left hand here. Should I put the phone in my left hand? I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the nut started. Um, so, as you, uh, there. as you tighten up this nut, I mean, initially, obviously, you don't have anything to worry about. But as you tighten up that nut, um, and it gets tight, uh, gets, gets uh, final tightness, um, you want to be rotating the hub as you tighten it. So right now I'm going to put the phone down and I'm going to snug it up the rest of the way um, while I rotate the hub. And the torque that you want to put on that is 50 uh, foot-pounds, um, but uh, the problem is that that's an inch and a half nut, and I don't have an inch and a half socket, so I can't use a torque wrench. But I can uh, fairly uh, uh, accurately estimate 50 foot-pounds by putting a pair of channel locks on there, which is like 10 inches long, and push on it with about, you know, 60 pounds of force or something like that. And that's going to get me my roughly 50 foot-pounds. And so you're going to want to rotate the drum as you tighten it. Um, and then, once it's tightened, you're going to want to back off the nut until it's... Uh, not in contact anymore and then you're going to put it on again until it's just finger tight so three steps one is that tighten it up to 50 foot pounds you know using a pair of channel locks on that nut um, as you rotate the drum and then without rotating the drum back it off until it's loose and then without rotating the drum finger tighten that nut back on there okay so I've done step one I tightened it up to 50 foot pounds while I was rotating it now I'm just going to loosen up that nut, and then I'm just going to bring it back finger tight. And my tool was kind of dirty, but um, it's fine. Um, so now it's finger tight on there. Um, I can rotate it now. That's our final position for that nut, except for one thing. We have to put this clip on here, and if you have to rotate, now the clip, there's a D on the shaft, the shaft has, has a flat spot on it, right? Um, and the flat spot on the shaft lines up with this little tab on the clip. Um, and then you snap it in so that it's over the, the nut, and that'll keep the nut from turning. And if you have to turn the nut a little bit to get the clip on, you want to back it off. If you have to back it off a tiny bit, that's not going to matter. So I think I've got it on a position now where I can snap it on, but i got to put the phone down. Okay, so I just tapped the, 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 the clip on there, and you can actually turn the nut a little bit with the clip, and that, that's how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be just slightly loose. There's not really any end play on it, because those bearings are tapered. Um, as you draw that up tight, it, it comes up to a, you know, sn snug enough that you can hardly turn the wheel, and then you back it off just a little bit, and you have the tension that you need. So now we're almost done. The last step is to um, use the easy lube feature to put more grease in the bearing. Now there are two schools of thought on this easy lube. Some people say they hate it because if you use too much pressure, 
you can blow out grease out the back seal. And as, as you can imagine, if grease came out that seal and went into the brake drum area, then you'd have grease all over your brakes. The other school of thought is, hey, I've been using these things for years and it works fine. Um, all you have to do is take it easy. So the um, uh, trick is to rotate the wheel as you pump grease using a grease gun into there. Rotate, rotate, rotate. Squeeze gently and slowly and allow time for the grease to go in there. And um, my guess is that if you do that, that, that'll work. There's lots of people that I've read that say they've been doing this for a long time and never had any trouble as long as you don't uh, use excess pressure to fill uh, the, the bearings with grease um, and as long as you rotate the wheels while you're doing it. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and I'll show you the results in a second. Okay, so here we are. I've pumped grease in there. As you can see, it's starting to come uh, out from the sides of the grease fitting there. Um, so we know that we've got at least uh, enough grease in there to keep these bearings lubricated. Um, I like this uh, um, easy lube in the sense that if I want to uh, put a little more grease in there, make sure it's in good shape after I've got a few thousand miles on it, um, I don't need to take apart everything and hand pack it again. I will probably hand pack these maybe like you know once every 12,000 miles or something like that and um, use a, a couple of pumps of grease on them um, every 3,000 miles to you know, make sure that um, it's got, still got grease in the bearings. So then the last step is to uh, put the last parts on. We have to put this, this cap back on. It's a simple matter of you know, kind of like putting the seal on to make sure it's fairly square. Use a wood block to drive it on and then there's a rubber cover that goes onto it and, um, and then uh, you're done. So we've, uh, today we've uh, replaced the shocks, we've greased the, the suspension, and we've uh, packed the wheel bearings and inspected the brakes, which is an important thing to do uh, periodically. Um, but again, you have to take the brake drum off to in inspect the brakes, so that's probably something that I would do, you know, kind of every uh, 12,000 miles or something like that. Okay, I hope this was helpful. Um, I'll... Uh, Catch you on the rebound. Bye-bye.